Hello, everyone, and welcome to Prioritizing Women and Girls in the COVID-19 Response, a discussion of U.S. gender priorities with the White House Gender Policy Council. I am Kat Fotovat, the Senior Official for the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues in the U.S. Department of State. It is really exciting to see such a high number of participants on today's call, and thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our esteemed speakers as well. Closed captions are available for today's discussion, should you wish to turn them on. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our panelists. We will discuss as many as we can during the question and answer period. Please don't be offended if we don't get to your question. We have a large number of participants. And now it is my honor to begin our event this afternoon by introducing Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the representative of the United States of America to the United Nations and our co-head of delegation to the Commission on the Status of Women this year. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield served 35 years as a career diplomat, including as Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, Director General of the Foreign Service, and Director of Human Resources, and U.S. Ambassador to Liberia. Most recently, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield led the African practice of the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global business strategy and commercial diplomacy firm. We are so honored to have her join us today. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. Thank you very much, Kat, and thank you so much for that introduction. And I want to thank uh, you, uh, a special thanks to the Secretary's Office of uh, Global Women's Issues, to the White House Gender Policy Council, and uh, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and, and Labor. Uh, for putting together this remarkable and very timely uh, event. It's so wonderful to be with fellow ambassadors and civil society and representatives to discuss such an important issue. COVID-19 has been called the great equalizer. After all, it has affected everyone. But the truth, the truth is, it hasn't affected us all equally. Instead, it has exac exacerbated existing inequalities. Poor communities and communities of color are being hit the hardest by the virus and receiving the least resources. And women, particularly women from these communities, have faced compounding threats, higher rates of gender-based violence, more economic hardship, and years of progress erased from our efforts to protect and educate girls. Today's event is the official US side event for the Commission on Women uh, on the status of women. We chose to focus on how the pandemic is affecting women and girls because it has the potential to change their lives for a generation to come. And I'm sure you'll hear many times today that the World Health Organization released a report last week in which it found that one in every three women will experience physical or sexual violence in her lifetime. We're going to keep repeating this statistic because this is a crisis. It's a calamity. What's more, we know that women and girls of color, women and girls with disabilities are even greater uh, at even higher risk of sexual and gender-based violence. They're also more likely to experience threats and harassments just for participating in public life. And I, I'll stop for a moment just uh, to uh, comment on the situation in Atlanta where we saw seven Asian women killed uh, because of who they are. And this is the kind, this is the kind of attack that have to stop uh, and we all have to stand up and support each other in, in these kinds of events. And I do wanna send my deepest condolences to, to the families and to the friends of, of these seven women. The pandemic has made the situation even more dire. The social isolation and financial desperation have led to a spike in gender-based violence this past year, especially intimate partner violence and violence against girls. The United Nations calls this the shadow pandemic. It is time to bring gender-based violence out of the shadows, out of the dark. It's time to shine a light on it. And it's time to treat this like an emergency with the urgency that it demands. For our part, I know the House is voting on reauthorizing the Violence Against Women's Act today. This is a bill the president himself wrote and championed more than 25 years ago. And if passed again, will save the lives of countless women and survivors. COVID-19 has also exacerbated economic barriers for women around the globe. 
The McKinsey Global Institute recently found that although women make up just 39% of the global labor force, they account for 54% of pandemic related job losses. That's significant. They also estimate that without interventions, the stalled progress on gender equity could cost the global economy trillions. I said trillions of dollars. The vice president has called this mass exodus of women from the workforce a national emergency. And I'd add that it's an international emergency as well. Meanwhile, COVID-19 seems to be reversing decades of hard-won gains for girls, whether on malnutrition or access to sexual and reproductive health, as well as to education. We're particularly concerned about education, in fact. According to UNESCO, 11 million girls may never go back to school after this year's educational disruptions. That's not just a threat to their advancement. It also puts them at higher risk of adolescent pregnancy, early and forced marriages, and other forms of gender-based violence. These are, uh, are issues of justice, and they are also issues of national security. After all, the evidence is overwhelming. Involving women in peacekeeping significantly, significantly increases the probability that violence will end. And by promoting women's participation and leadership in politics, in mediations, in negotiations, we promote more security and more peace for women. And that's especially true when we, we include and empower women with multiple identities that face discrimination, including women of color and women with disabilities. But if putting women in leadership roles makes this world more peaceful and reduces gender-based violence and economic hardship, then threats to women and girls do just the opposite. So the United States is stepping up. We are going to take the lead in advancing gender equity. That's why President Biden established the White House Gender Policy Council last week, and, and it's why we're hosting today's event. We need to put women and girls at the top of the agenda, provide financial lifelines to women, and protect and educate girls. And I'm looking forward to pushing those priorities forward with all of you from my role as the UN ambassador, but also from a personal standpoint. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. And sincere thanks. You have really put gender equity as a priority through all of your leadership in such a short time. And I can't tell you how much it has meant across the board. So thank you so much. Thank you. Now it is, I am very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning's event one of the co-chairs of the White House Gender Policy Council and the executive director, Jennifer Klein. Previously, Jen was the chief strategy and policy officer at Time's Up. She was a professor at Georgetown Law and advised Secretary Clinton on many years on promoting women's rights and integrating gender equity into foreign policy. Jen has the full trust of the president. He has asked her to ensure gender equity is a top priority throughout the Biden-Harris administration across the country and around the world. We are so grateful for her participation in this year's Commission on the Status of Women. Now I am pleased to hand it over to Jen and noting I'm sure everybody wants to know how much of a difference this has made for our gender equity across the board. It has made a huge difference. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you, Kat, and thank you, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, um, to both of you for, for today, for what you're doing, and for your leadership overall. Um, my name is Jennifer Klein, um, as Kat said, and I'm one of the two co-chairs of the White House Gender Policy Council and also its executive director. I am so thrilled to be here with you today to share some of our key priorities on gender at the White House and also to really dig deeper on the critical topic of today's discussion, which is how the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately, as you just heard so powerfully from Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, affected women and girls, and importantly, how we can better prioritize the needs of women and girls in pandemic response efforts. This conversation comes during what has already been a very exciting and busy month for the US government on gender issues. Last week, again, as you just heard, on International Women's Day, President Biden announced an executive order formally establishing the White House Gender Policy Council, which reports directly to him. 
As many as, you, um, as many of you know, this council really elevates gender equality priorities within the administration. And we intend to make this whole of government, a whole of government effort throughout the administration, including as members of the cabinet are nominated, confirmed and join the council formally, including uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. Um, since the State Department is hosting this event today, I also want to note another major International Women's Day event when First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, Secretary Tony Blinken, and Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, and uh, Global Women's Issue Senior Official Kat Fotovat hosted the 15th International Women of Courage Awards. As many of you also may know, I earlier in my career served in the State Department under Secretary Clinton in the Office of Global Women's Issues. And every year, the event, the IWOC event was a highlight. Um, these awards are an unbelievable opportunity to spotlight the incredible work that women, many of them from civil society, do on behalf of their countries and their communities. And earlier this week, we were so proud to have Vice President Harris deliver the US statement uh, national statement for the 65th Commission on the Status of Women, the first UN speech for our first ever woman vice president. President Biden and Vice President Harris have made it very clear that advancing gender equality and equity is a matter of human rights and a strategic imperative for the United States. Gender equality reduces poverty, increases access to education, improves health and fosters democracy. This administration is not only deeply committed and convinced of the need to marshal this whole of government approach to drive gender equality, we are deeply committed to doing so. We know that this work is vitally important always, but particularly important uh, today in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Women of girls have faced increased rates of gender-based violence, disrupted access to sexual and reproductive health, health services, loss of access to education and disproportionate job loss and insecurity. And this is true in the United States and around the world. Women have also taken on additional caretaking responsibilities. The economic impact is stunning. And I actually won't repeat the statistics with, we did not coordinate earlier, but the, the statistics that Ambassador Thomas Greenfield just said, which really could be repeated again because they are so stunning, um, were very much what I was planning to, to note as well. You know, I'll also just add, which simply reinforces the point that women in many countries are um, more likely to be employed. You know, we've seen this disproportionate job loss for many reasons, but one of them is because so many of the women are employed in sectors that have been particularly devastated by this crisis, including education and hospitality and retail, or concentrated in the informal economy, working as market vendors or domestic workers, and therefore they've been especially vulnerable to unemployment. Um, and they also, women globally also have only 77% of access to financial services than men. So even when help comes, they may be less likely to be able to receive stimulus payments from governments, again, here and around the world. In addition, women leaders around the world have unfortunately often faced intimidation and violence, especially in their roles in COVID-19 response and recovery. As our panelists will discuss in more detail, the disproportionate impacts have an inverse relationship to the decision-making authority women have had throughout this pandemic. Women are delivering healthcare. They make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but they represent just a quarter of senior leaders for global public health. We see the effects of this lack of representation. And I know that everyone here is, is here to talk about it, but also to do something about it. I wanted to take a few minutes. I, I'm guessing many have, have seen or are aware of the executive order establishing the Gender Policy Council, but I wanna call attention to a few high priority areas that are particularly relevant to today's discussion. The executive order that, commit, that uh, created the council commits us to coordinating a comprehensive interagency response to gender-based violence, which is again, as you've just heard, has risen dramatically domestically and globally. So our efforts will include creating a national action plan to end gender-based violence um, and establish a government-wide approach to end gender-based violence. And we will also update the 2016 United States strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally. 
President Biden has been a, st a stalwart champion for prevention and response to gender-based violence throughout his career, and he will continue to be as president. The work has really already begun with the American Rescue Plan, which contained a total of $447.5 million in supplemental funding to address gender-based violence. This includes increased funding for domestic violence shelters and related assistance programs, support for sexual assault services and for tribal responses to gender-based violence, funding for community-based and culturally specific services to reach survivors from marginalized communities who face additional barriers to safety and, and uh, security. As I'm sure you've also seen, the House is literally voting to reauthorize the Violence Against Women's Act with bipartisan support. Um, and the president issued strong statements this, mor this morning supporting this legislation and urging swift passage in both the House and the Senate, again, following up on his lifelong commitment to this particular bill and to the issue more generally. This increased support is coming at a critical time for gender-based violence prevent prevention and response. Working to end this pervasive form of violence is the linchpin to creating an environment that enables progress really on every other gender issue from women's political participation to women's economic empowerment. This ties into another priority for the council, which is access to sexual and reproductive health care information and services. The executive order recognizes that increasing access to comprehensive health care, addressing health disparities, and promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights are matters of gender equality. Before the pandemic even began, more than 200 million in low and middle income countries had an unmet need for, for modern contraception. We know that this has a serious impact, impact on maternal, reproductive, and infant health. And again, this was pre-pandemic. In previous public health emergencies, we saw that the serious impact, we saw the serious impact that overburdened healthcare systems and disruptions in care had on women and girls access to sexual and reproductive health services. This time is no different. According to newly released data by UNFPA, an estimated 12 million women experienced disrupted access to family planning services, with 1.4 million unintended pregnancies as a result. The U.S. sees this as a critical area we must address if we are to build back better for everyone. Building back better also entails increasing economic security and opportunity by addressing the structural barriers to women's participation in the labor force that you've heard about and by decreasing wage and wealth gaps. This includes addressing caregiving needs which have grown substantially during the pandemic. Work to address the economic impacts of COVID-19 on women is happening in many places across the government. And our job is to support that work and to ensure that the focus on women and gender equality and racial equity isn't siloed, but actually infused throughout our policies and our response, whether that's through the Department of State, which is hosting today's event or any other US agency, including of course, those that work domestically. This is true for all of our priority issues of focus. We'll be working with partners across the federal government. Um, the, part, the council reports to the president, but it also specifically works directly with the Domestic Policy Council, the National Economic Council, and the National Security Council to both cover domestic and global priorities and to ensure that this focus on gender equity and equality really is infused throughout. The council also nominally and formally counts almost every cabinet secretary among its members, but it also asks each agency to designate senior level officials to work with the council on gender equity and equality. And this will enable us to realize a robust interagency process that will continue throughout the work of the administration. I'm sure that those of you um, are, who are advocates on the line today also, I hope, noticed that President Biden asked for a national strategy in the executive order to be finalized within 200 days. This will be our first big task to coordinate, draft, and then help implement a government-wide strategy to advance gender equity and equality at, against which each agency, including ours, will be asked to report on their progress annually. And finally, and very much in the, the spirit of today's uh, US hosted side event, the executive order requires us to coordinate and engage with representatives of a diverse range of nonprofit and community-based organizations, civil society groups, and multilateral organizations. 
We know that regardless of administration, all of you have been doing this work every day, day in and day out. And on behalf of and in service of um, the women and girls that we all place at the core of our work. I'm so grateful to you for having done that work and continuing to do that work. And I'm uh, particularly mindful of the collaboration and dedication um, to that as I come to my work at the council. The Commission on the Status of Women is the kickoff for these discussions, although I know we'll have many more together. Again, I'm grateful to you uh, for engaging with us today and every day. Thank you very much to our panelists for being here, including two of our public delegates on this year's CSW delegation, Gayatri Patel from CARE and Dr. Rupa Dot from Women in Global Health. Thank you both for your service and your participation. And finally, thank you again to the office, the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues and the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor for making today's event a reality. And with that, I turn it back to you, Kat, um, who will moderate the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Jen. Sincere thank you for all your leadership and for sharing more information on the White House Gender Policy Council. We appreciate all the amazing work so far and thank you for your partnership, not just with us, but the broader gender community. And we look forward to continuing to advance gender equality together. Now we will turn to our panel discussion. In the interest of time, I will briefly introduce each panelist, noting their bios were shared in the final details email and ask a question about their work. After each panelist has an opportunity to respond, we will turn to the audience Q&A portion of the discussion. Rupa, let's start with you. Rupa Dot is the executive director and co-founder of Women in Global Health. Rupa, let's have a kind of a framing of some of the contextual issues going on. Um, as a physician and Women in Global Health's research shows that women have not been equally represented in decision-making during the COVID-19 pandemic, though they have been borne the disproportionate share of the negative impacts whether that's in access to healthcare, rates of increasing violence or job loss. What do your data tell us about the importance of women's leadership to prevent these impacts? And how can we, how can movements like women in global health movement support diverse women to have a voice in global health? Great, thank you, Kat. And uh, really thank you for hosting this timely and critical dialogue. We appreciate the leadership shown by the new US administration at the highest levels on gender equality and especially in prioritizing women and girls. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the fundamental flaws and inequalities that we must put right urgently if we are to better be prepared for the next pandemic. One of the deepest inequalities in gender inequality undermines all our health systems and global health security. Women are around 70% of the health and care workers globally, but they only hold 25% of decision-making roles. And this pattern has been repeated in this pandemic. Our research shows that 85% of national COVID-19 task forces have majority male membership, and that is comprised of over 87 countries around the world. The US has been in no exception at the start of this pandemic. The extraordinary work done by women, health and care workers on the front line in the pandemic has not earned them an equal seat at the decision-making table, and we have all lost out on their talent and expertise. When women are marginalized in leadership, decisions are made that ignore the realities of women's life and cause lasting harm and death. I'm going to provide two examples. For example, one third of countries in a WHO survey reported disruptions to maternity services in the pandemic. Women know that pregnancy does not stop for pandemics. Women have died because they could not access safe maternity services, just as they have died in Ebola outbreaks for the same reason. A second example, women are the majority of the health and care workers, but incredibly personal protective equipment, PPE in many countries is modeled on male bodies. If PPE doesn't fit women's bodies or their bodily functions, it leaves them exposed to infection and working in undignified con conditions. As a result, the UN sent adult diapers to nurses on the front lines in Wuhan, China, who are working long shifts and unable to remove their PPE. I believe these are two of many decisions that would not have been made by female decision makers. The pandemic has also exposed the fact that global health security rests on the fragile foundation of an unequal health workforce with severe health worker shortages everywhere, including in the United States. There is a projected global shortage of 40 million healthcare workers and 18 million additional healthcare workers are needed to achieve universal health coverage in low and middle income countries. With COVID-19, health workers have died, millions have been infected, and many will have long-term health impacts. 
Health workers are over the world are experiencing mental trauma and women in particular are considering leaving the profession. If the world is to move forward on health and reducing health inequalities, we cannot afford to lose even one trained health worker. Women are also the majority in the health and care workforce, but clustered into lower paid and lower status roles and commonly subject to harassment. Women worldwide contribute 3 trillion to health annually, but half of that is in the form of unpaid work. The poorest women in the world currently subsidize health systems with their unpaid work that has been done and exposed loud and clear but the, uh, by the pandemic and it is not new information. It should not have taken a pandemic to focus the world's attention on health and the deep health inequalities within and between countries. Um, COVID-19 has been a major health, social, economic, and political shock. And this is therefore the time for radical thinking and what we value and how to rebuild health systems for future health security. Last month, Women in Global Health, in partnership, launched the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative with the Government of France and the World Health Organization, which we plan to gather commitments to drive change on leadership, pay, safety, and decent work for women in the workforce, and our health depends on this. We're asking all member states, including the United States of America and international agencies, to work with us to address gender inequity with, within the health and care workforce. 2021 has been designated the year of the health and care workers, and it is a year of the generation equality forms, marking the 1995 Beijing Women's Conference. This is the right year to build momentum for gender transformative change in health and social care. Just over five years ago, I was one of the four early career women in medicine who met on Twitter asking the same question, why are there so many well-qualified women in global health, but so few in senior decision-making roles? That was how Women in Global Health was born. Today, as Executive Director of Women in Global Health, I lead a growing global movement that has been driven by volunteer women power, has 50,000 supporters, and is on track to have national chapters in 50 countries by the end of this year. In the middle of such a devastating global health emergency, I've been proud in the last year to do my job as a physician. I have also been privileged to build the Women in Global Health platform and enable women from low and middle income countries to be heard at national and global levels. I've been inspired by the women in our chapters from countries like Somalia, leaders in their own right, working on the front lines of patient care in COVID-19 with very few resources as, as I have had as a clinician in the United States. Gender parity in health leadership will strengthen decision-making and encourage women to stay in and enter the health profession. Beyond gender parity and numbers, however, we want diverse women in global health leadership, particularly women from the global south, and we want health leaders of all genders to be gender transformative leaders and address power and privilege to enable the best talent to be at the global health decision-making table. Gender inequity in health and care workforce is a global problem and therefore everybody's business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rupa, for giving the context on health and healthcare and, and the gender issues facing them. Next, we will hear from Saba Gori. Saba is the Senior Director of Prevention and Response Initiatives at Vital Voices and is responsible for leading Voices Against Violence, the Gender-Based Violence Initiative. Saba, based on all the work that Vital Voices and your consortium partners have done during this pandemic, can you share with us what you are seeing as some of the biggest challenges survivors of gender-based violence are facing, particularly in accessing services and support? Specifically, how has COVID-19 impacted your referring service providers? And what are some of the innovative approaches that your partners are taking on as a result of this pandemic to best support survivors? Thank you so much, Kat, and the rest of the panel for, for having us here and for having me here and participating. Um, you know, our referral partners, have seen an increase in extreme forms of gender-based violence cases overall due to various factors that we've talked about, especially the lockdowns, the isolation, the economic impact of uh, the pandemic. Other challenges they are facing include increased costs to provide for PPE and for internet use when they're re working remotely um, and for services, reducing uh, reduced access to funding for organizations. We're seeing a lot of that, uh, reduced funds, um, and increased prices for food and other needed items um, that a lot of our partners are struggling with. Since 2013, Vital Voices has been providing emergency assistance to survivors of extreme forms of gender-based violence and has helped nearly 2,000 survivors. Since the global pandemic started, 
Vital Voices began to specifically provide urgent financial assistance to survivors of GBV as a, as a direct result of the pandemic. And since we started tracking the COVID cases in October, 70% of the survivors we have supported experienced violence because of COVID-19. And you know, we work with referral partners. Out of the 38 referral partners we are working with, approximately 80% had submitted requests for COVID-related cases. And so um, while we're seeing definitely a, a significant increase in violence um, and survivors needing their services in countries like Uganda, Niger, Martania, we're also seeing um, and we're seeing increased calls to hotlines, not just from survivors, but also from family members and neighbors who are asking how they can help. We're also seeing less women come forward out of fear of infection at a shelter or challenges with inability to travel. So for instance, in Guinea or Mexico and Argentina, we're, we're seeing some of these issues as well. Um, in some areas, calls decrease, signaling the impact of isolation and survivors' inability to access services. So, and what, what the pandemic has also highlighted is there is a lack of coordinated response and services. And even before the pandemic, you know, we often talk, as, as, talk about this as GBV service providers, that there's need for coordinated response. But of course, being in isolation has really highlighted the lack of coordinated response. Um, many have had to use some of the funds, the, the funds that they received to cover costs they normally wouldn't have even have had to worry about, like needing to cover PPE or COVID tests. Um, and while it is difficult for survivors to access social services like health services, one of the biggest challenges we're seeing is the delays in the legal system reported by our referrers, um, who are, which is preventing survivors from getting access to justice, especially since many courts remain closed in places like um, Iraq or South Africa. And while the need for GBV services in, is increasing, availability of services is decreasing. So many shelters are closed due to limited capacity or they have taken, been taken over for COVID care. Um, so shelter service providers are taking on additional functions as well. Um, our referrers are sometimes unable to meet with partners in person. And so they're pivoting to remote services. And we've seen this with some of our partners in Zimbabwe, Argentina, Tunisia, South Africa, Honduras. Our partner in Tunisia, for example, has created a hotline as a pivot from in-person services. And in Honduras, um, some of the, you know, the hurricanes had, take, had taken out phone services, which further limited referrers' ability to connect with survivors, so leading to more challenges. Um, as an example of additional work that our partners are doing, in Mauritania, one of our local partners who had primarily focused on violence prevention and protecting youth is now going into schools and providing soap and healthcare lessons. In Guinea, a, 50 pay, a, a 150 bed shelter partnered with healthcare organizations to keep the shelter open by using extreme health and hygiene measures. Um, in Honduras, legal services are being offered online to allow for virtual visits with survivors. And in Cuba, a helpline was, was created that doesn't require the internet so that those without access can utilize the service. But it's also important to remember that technological solutions are not accessible, obviously, to all survivors. And sometimes technology can lead to more problems and can lead to survivors feeling more trapped, especially when um, they share the phone or a computer with the, an abusive partner. We're also seeing, though, some really interesting innovations. There is an increasing need to figure out how to get resources to survivors in isolation using networks and innovation. So we need the greater, we need greater quality and types of hotlines that go beyond just typical hotlines. So where you could use emails, WhatsApp, et cetera. One campaign utilized audio recording cooking recipes that actually had hidden information on how to access resources. The COVID-19 response really presents an opportunity for new actors to get involved and new uh, sectors to work together in a multi-sectoral way. Organizations and businesses that are not typical GBV service providers can connect with local GBV service providers so survivors can help get the help they need. So for example, in Argentina, pharmacies were op which remain open as an essential, as an essential business um, were helping survivors and people at risk 
um, by asking pharmacists for a red mask to signal that they're in need of help. So pharmacies remained open and they had this signal to help people um, by wearing a red mask so they knew that they were in need of help. We have um, a local partner we're working with in Iraq right now called Asuda that supports listening centers that offers direct services um, through listening centers, offers legal aid and psychosocial support, and they do a lot of men's engagement. Well, they've turned some of these actual men's engagement, engagement trainings into webinars. And where they were only initially operating in Kurdistan, they're now operating all over Iraq through webinars, and they're able, they were able to expand the number of participants as well through that. They added group therapy sessions um, on, they, you know, they added extra group therapy sessions that um, over the phone. Um, they, uh, they also had live sessions, in-person sessions, but people weren't able to make it to the session, uh, to the listening centers due to their economic situations and, and, and challenges with transportation. So Asuda covered those transportation costs, thus enabling more people to have access to psychiatrists. Um, one of our other leading partners in the Middle East, an organization called Abad, which works with men and boys and GBV awareness in Lebanon, has developed a creative way of sharing information about a domestic violence helpline through banners placed on balconies and in windows, overcoming constraints of isolation and limited internet or phone services. And governments are taking up more. Governments are taking on more. So for instance, the French and Spanish governments launched initiatives where it told women to head to drugstores and say the code word mask 19 to pharmacists to signal that they're experiencing abuse so the police could respond. Other governments have stepped up by offering more hotlines and setting up new apps. There's been new hotlines launched in Japan, in India, in Vietnam, Nepal, Pakistan, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Bolivia, I mean, many countries and other countries have also uh, stepped up resources as well. We also, of course, have some amazing stories of our own Vital Voice women leaders. So I'd like to just share one, one, one or two quick stories. Since COVID-19 began to spread in Malaysia, Heidi Kwa used to rally, she rallied with four other local organizations and 90 volunteers to gather, pack and deliver food aid to 1,000 refugees and migrants per week during the nationwide lockdown. She supported over 41,000 individuals in 930 locations in Kuala Lumpur and Selangor since lockdowns began. And in recognition of her work, she was given um, you know, an award for that. Um, given the lockdowns resulting from quarantine across the world, one of our other leaders from Indonesia, Chandra Warantu, sought to raise awareness about violence against women in Indonesia, particularly how to address online recruitment and online commercial sex trafficking. She worked to make recommendations at the city, state, federal, and international level on addressing trafficking during the COVID pandemic. She engaged in virtual communication and awareness building activities and raised funds for basic needs of survivors due to the diversion of funds to COVID-19 and helped wellness activities, including support groups, yoga and Zumba to promote mental health for survivors. So there's a lot that our partners are doing and there's a lot that the women leaders are doing even amidst this uh, pandemic and doing the best that they can. Thanks so much, Saba, for providing some information on the challenges facing GBV survivors and organizations that are uh, fighting and combating GBV and some of the great innovative approaches and, and highlighting some of the local organizations such as Asuda that are doing amazing work. Thank you so much. Um, now we will turn and hear from Gayatri Patel, who is the Director of Gender Advocacy at CARE USA and co-chair of the Coalition for Women's Economic Empowerment and Equality. Gayatri, we know that CARE has conducted over 60 rapid gender assessments and reports to identify the gender aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's imp very impressive. We are, what are some of your key findings, especially pertaining to the economic impact on women? And why are rapid gender assessments and gender analysis so critical to this work? Thanks so much, Kat. Thank you for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I, I really do wanna thank um, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, as well as Ms. Klein for all of the work that they have been doing, all of the work that they will be doing to, to really keep up the attention and the highlight on these issues. Um, so you mentioned, Kat, that we've, we've done 60 rapid gender analyses. 
Care works in 100 countries around the world, providing development assistance, humanitarian assistance. And since the onset of the COVID-19 crisis, we've conducted over 60 rapid gender analyses and reports uh, in countries and regions around the world because we understand that crises like COVID will for sure impact men, women, girls, boys, other genders differently. We also know that factors like race, age, disability, sexual orientation and gender identity and other factors really must be taken into account. So we do these rapid gender analyses to really understand and, and quickly assess the different uh, the different roles in a community, the different needs, capacities, power dynamics, structures, so that we can tailor our interventions appropriately. Um, and the, the ultimate purpose really is to make sure that we're doing no harm in the interventions that we design and that we're leaving no one behind, given how multidimensional and, and nuanced some of these issues are. And so in terms of the, the findings of some of our, of our analyses, I mean, we've, we've heard a number of them already. It's, it's you know, very clear we're, we're seeing women and girls' unpaid care work burdens increasing, while at the same time their livelihoods and their jobs are at risk. Um, we're seeing gender-based violence, which was already at really alarming levels before the crisis, skyrocketing because of the crisis. Um, we're seeing access to critical health services, such as sexual and reproductive health services and family planning be disrupted. Um, including the, the statistic that Ms. Klein referenced, which is 100, or sorry, 1.4 million unintended pregnancies as, as a result of 12 million women losing access to contraceptives. Um, we're seeing women and girls' food insecurity growing more acute. Um, and we're seeing women and girls with other intersecting identities, uh, women of color, women living under or close to the poverty line, women with disabilities, older women, LGBTI women, migrant women, they're all feeling these impacts even more acutely. And despite all of this, women and girls are consistently and um, across the, the, the spectrum cut out of leadership and decision making about the responses to COVID. And so the, the responses that are coming out are not, you know, addressing the, the needs that are really pertinent to them. Uh, and they're, they're, not, they're not as effective as they could be. It's also important to note, and you know, this is something that I think all of us understand, that these were all issues that disproportionately affected women and girls even before the crisis. These were all inequalities. These were all um, issues that, that we were dealing with every day. And the pandemic is really exacerbating them. But what the crisis has done is really laid bare the, you know, the impact, the consequences of not dealing with gender inequality. We're seeing that the impacts of this crisis are worse because of gender inequality. And so it really becomes a call to action that before the next crisis comes up, we really need to look hard at some of these structures and, and some of these issues. You asked me about particular impacts on women's economic empowerment. And I, I mean, I think that a lot of the, the key themes we've, we've discussed so far, um, unpaid care burdens remain the women's domain. Um, women already performed before the crisis three times as much unpaid care as men, which I think equated to about 76% of all unpaid care work. Um, now with school closures, with caring for sick family members, those unpaid care burdens are rising, which leaves women less time, less energy, less ability, less resource to focus on participating in the economy. Um, and I think, you know, our, our traditional underinvestment in social support services is really showing. I mean, we, the, the Ambassador Thomas Greenfield re referenced the McKinsey report that just came out in September that found that one in four women are considering leaving the workforce partially because of these added unpaid care burdens that they, that they have to take on. And so it's really important to look at, you know, what are, what's causing this and, and how can we as, you know, policymakers, as advocates, in, influence it and fix it. We're also seeing that women's jobs and livelihoods are less secure. Over 740 million women work in the informal sector, which are, and, and those are jobs that are really vulnerable to elimination. We're seeing particularly in feminized sectors, such as domestic work, that this is a, a really big concern. 72% of domestic workers lost their jobs as a result of COVID. 80% of whom are women. 
And this is particularly challenging for marginalized communities, such as undocumented migrant workers or women with disabilities who already face job insecurity to begin with. Beyond that, we're also seeing women as entrepreneurs facing setbacks on some of the gains that they've made. There's, there's always been a, a gap in terms of women accessing financial services or uh, a gender or digital gap which is causing women entrepreneurs, women business owners to have challenges in pivoting their businesses to adapt to COVID realities like restrictions on movement. And all of this is leading to, to the idea that COVID-19 is really widening the gender poverty gap and pushing more people into poverty. There's one estimate that the slowing economy, job losses, lack of social protection will push between 71 million and 135 million people back into extreme poverty, the majority of whom are women and girls. And there are, of course, other issues to factor in, the, the gender pay gap, um, lack of access to sexual and reproductive health services, particularly now when COVID has exacerbated the, the lack of access to those services, has a direct impact on women's ability to participate in the economy. Gender-based violence has always been a barrier to women's economic empowerment. Um, and, and the increases in GBV that we're seeing right now that Zabo was talking about really kind of sharpens this. Um, but we're also seeing the fact that women are, are more job insecure at a time when you know, job insecurity is, is growing anyways. Um, we're seeing that that can lead to more exploitation in the, in the workplace, more harassment. And so we really need to look at these, these impacts and these you know, kind of related issues that are impacting women's participation in the economy, their livelihood, their income, their ability to meet their needs and, and their family's needs. Thanks so much, Gayatri. And thanks for CARE for also being a part of the Voices Against Violence Consortium. We appreciate some of the assessments from the rapid gender assessments that you've done and uh, information on the economic impact on women and this global crisis that we're facing. Um, and now we will turn to Ana Inez Alvarez. She's a social worker and program manager at, a at the Avon Foundation in Argentina. We are proud to work with the Avon Foundation for Women as the department's private sector partner on the Voices Against Violence initiative. Ana, during the lockdown in Argentina, the Avon Foundation created hashtag isolated, not alone campaign. Can you talk about what inspired you to start this, the tools you developed as a part of the campaign and how you were able to amplify through Avon's networks. Hi, Kat. Hi, everyone. Thank you. You will probably agree with me that COVID-19 changed everything. And with that said, let me invite you to rethink together that aff affirmation by taking a look to these numbers. According to the Argentinian NGO La Casa del Encuentro, in 2019, 299 femicides were committed in Argentina. In 2020, 300 femicides were committed in Argentina. In the first two months of 2021, 55 femicides were committed in Argentina. COVID-19 certainly didn't change everything, didn't change these numbers, didn't prevent this violence to occur. Since lockdown started all over the world to prevent from COVID, early alarms went off for those we work in GBV. And it was like seeing a plane going down, every possible alarm went off to advise what was going on. And we could identify an immediately increase of the outreach by women to service providers and hotlines during lockdowns. In Argentina, the national hotline registered over a 40% increase, having to amplify, as Saba said, the ways of contact. WhatsApp lines, for instance, were included because not all women could make a phone call. On the other hand, formal reports didn't increase in the same amount. In fact, they went down, showing that reinforced isolation persuade many women from leaving their homes, reinforcing their control situation, and we can assume many reasons. One of them may be the inefficiency of coordinated government responses, but also fear for retaliation, shame. But reports, in many cases, for those who could did them, didn't prevent violence from occurring. In the past few weeks in Argentina, we attended to several femicides that showed that complaints and calls for help were not attended properly. Urgency was underestimated and the coordinated community response was absent. 
with the reinforced isolation situation that in our minds, in our top of our mind, isolated not alone movement was born. At the beginning of, we intended to, to develop a campaign to boost public awareness and outreach about the increase of intimate partner violence that was occurring during isolation. But as we were developing it, we understood we had a complex situation, an urgent situation to attend. And we defined two initial goals. First, to develop innovative mechanisms to virtually skip isolation, developing key messages to women suffering intimate partner violence. And in the second goal was to find ways to encourage people, family, neighbors, to find ways to get involved and became virtual bystanders. Because society silence was fundamental, a fundamental driver for violence to continue occurring. So we developed the Trojan horses. It's something Saba mentioned. As a way to deliver these key messages, we developed four Trojan horses. Disguised as cooking recipes, we deliver vital information to women suffering intimate partner violence. Aggressors will probably show more distrust from a friend direct message rather from a cooking tutorial. These videos were performed by well-known cooks who are committed to the cause and donate their work. The first 10 seconds of the video make you think it was a cooking tutorial. Afterwards, they suggest putting on your headphones to continue. Those videos were sent by all Avon representatives and associates to all their networks and to the public in general, disguised as the saving recipes for quarantine. But saving recipes were not enough. An active bystander approach was needed. People at home should also assume a role within those women that they were or might be experiencing violence. To have a strong community coordinated response, nearby networks are the kickoff points. Without them, she will probably not reach for help until a situation is critical. We carried on an awareness isolated, not alone public campaign in on and in off initiatives. We conducted several public conversations with social media influencers, not familiarized with the GBB conversations. We took over their networks and we detected some cases during broadcast, which were immediately redirected to local services. But we also developed a campaign that is called uh, I drop you an audio message. How many times you told someone, I can text you, let me send you a message, a voice message. These five audio campaign include relevant contact to share and to generate awareness and promote everyone to get involved by delivering easy tips of how to do the bystander approach with a woman experiencing GBV. Isolated Not Alone was not only a LATAM campaign in Argentina, uh, every country within Avon jumped into the movement, creating the conversations needed to address GBV during COVID-19 context. And finally, Isolated Not Alone became the Natura and co-claim and compromise. A million dollars donation was made from Avon Foundation to local NGOs to support their frontline services. We have to make campaigns for awareness, to support the bystander network, but also to help the NGOs in the front line, understanding that efforts were not enough while tackling GBV. Perhaps you might ask, what role does corporate social responsibility play in GBV? What Avon has to do with it? We must become key role play players, declaring our compromise against gender-based violence is not enough. We should carry on active initiatives throughout our business models. Declarations are over. Action, a real compromise is needed. Thank you, Kat. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you to the Avon Foundation for serving as such an incredible example for the private sector, which is such a vital partner in the recovery efforts. And finally, we will hear from Mike Jobbins, the Vice President of Global Affairs and Partnerships at Search for Common Ground. Mike, Search for Common Ground has supported community leaders, both women and men, in conflict-affected areas, places to build trust amidst Ebola and the current COVID-19 pandemic. 
What does that look like? And what do you think the pandemic and the recovery might mean for societies in the longer term? Looking at five, 10 years on, and how will we look back at this very moment? Thanks a lot, Kat, and thanks to everyone who, who spoke before me. And I'm really looking forward to, to the questions and the interaction with the uh, fantastic group of, of people who are gathered here. Um, as you mentioned, you know, Search for Common Ground, we support people building healthy, safe, and just societies from Myanmar to Afghanistan to Yemen, South Sudan, uh, Congo, Sahel. And we have really deep uh, connections to, to societies and, and to people uh, affected by, by these conflicts around the world. And the one thing that we took from that from our experience with COVID, but before that Ebola, or even our work with HIV AIDS and the Black and Hispanic communities here in DC uh, in the 80s and 90s, is that the response to any crisis is fundamentally driven by trust. And that's especially true when we're talking about something so intimate and personal as health and the household dynamics, the household economy, uh, as COVID has been. Uh, and so it's one's trust in one's neighbors and the media and, and ultimately in the authorities really shifts and, and shapes how one experiences conflict, how one experiences crisis, and particularly how one experiences the resources available to help with coping uh, as uh, both the pandemic and conflict in mesh uh, uh, within uh, uh, one's own, own experience. And, it, you know, throughout this whole crisis, we've really seen the way that trust and COVID measures have really tracked on to how people trust the government writ large. Um, people, and, and a lot of the places where we work, uh, people don't know, trust, or like their government or think their government has their best interests at heart, uh, often for, for really good reasons. Um, so for example, in Nigeria, 60% of Nigerians uh, don't trust the COVID response of their government. And as we look across Yemen, Palestine, Nigeria, Tanzania, uh, we see that really quite, quite common, whether that's in uh, a vaccine uh, skepticism about uh, uh, the vaccine, skepticism about mask wearing or other kinds of response measures. Uh, mistrust is, is driven by lack of information, is dri driven by lack of, of access to services, uh, or in uh, one's own experience of, of loss, a betrayal, or the socioeconomic impact of the crisis. And all of these are things that we know is very gendered, uh, very much uh, shaped uh, by gender, by class, by race, by where one lives. Um, not everywhere, but in many, many societies, uh, women have uh, less access to social media, less access to broadcast media uh, than their male uh, uh, husbands or, or men in their lives. Uh, we know uh, as well from our studies that uh, the impact of lockdowns have, has dramatically uh, decreased the amount of access women have to social networks outside of their home. In low resource or conflict affected places, um, women uh, have particularly uh, it, uh, where they're playing roles of caregivers and looking after the health of the family. They've been particularly uh, offended by, uh, for example, women in, in uh, IDP camps in Syria, um, when they're listening to public service announcement that you should wash your hands three times a day when there's no water to drink, uh, you know, for, or no water to bathe uh, their child. That's deeply offensive um, and, and deeply infuriating. And so those kinds of messages uh, that are produced for general audience can be quite alienating uh, and losing the trust uh, of women uh, around the world. And then finally, um, you know, we talked about the economic impact and the baseline economic impact uh, on women, but I wanted to highlight that the shutting down, for example, uh, of markets that where petty tra female petty traders operate or closing schools, not only has a direct immediate impact, but it shuts down the pathway to the middle class for many of the poorest women uh, who are looking for them, you know, looking for that as a channel to advance um, and, and develop their own lives. And so, Maybe three lessons as we uh, think about how to build trust and put trust at the center of a public health response. Uh, the first is to, uh, is to question ideology. The second, to rethink what leadership is. And the third is to be honest with people. Um, by questioning the, uh, the ideology, what I mean is a lot of government public health messages coming out of the World Health Organization, coming out of ministries of health, have a deep ideology that says, this is a message from the Ministry of Health. It's authoritative. You should trust us. What that does is it alienates people who don't see the Ministry of Health as someone that they can trust or who don't necessarily trust authorities because of their own experience of violence or conflict. And so instead, what we've seen in Ebola, what we've seen in COVID is making investments in things like town criers in Guinea or in, in Congo, supporting the young journalists at Ghetto Radio in Kabira slum of Nairobi is a different way of getting the message out through appropriate means and isn't relying on that credibility through authority that underlines the, the ideology of a lot of the risk communication. The second is rethinking what leadership is. There's an instinct, particularly in crisis management, 
to view leadership as authority. And in a society where most positions in authority, um, as Dr. Data was uh, uh, highlighting, where most people in authority are men, then you're going to, if you define leadership as authority, then you're going to be, be identifying men. If you look at leadership as influence, who can shift how things play out? Who can shift whether a woman feels comfortable uh, uh, getting a, a vaccine, whether or not someone feels like they uh, can adapt uh, to the COVID uh, constraint measures, then you're working with different kinds of people. You're working with groups like she, uh, I and she in Syria who are mobilizing uh, volunteers to deal with, uh, to reach out household by household uh, to women headed households on how they deal and cope with all of the impacts of, uh, uh, of, uh, of COVID or you're working with power, uh, uh, health extension workers in Kenya who are negotiating access for doctors to reach into Al-Shabaab and other dangerous neighborhoods. So if you're looking at, if you're redefining leadership in terms that are more inclusive of young people, of women, of non-traditional actors, then you'll find a whole different set of stakeholders who need to be involved in shaping the health response. And then finally, uh, there's this whole question, I, th I think particularly in a lot of the, the most marginalized societies uh, along the lines of what Anna was talking about is of simply taking people seriously, taking women seriously, taking seriously uh, women who are at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, or, or marginalized. So for example, uh, my colleagues in Nigeria are producing uh, podcasts uh, and radio shows uh, on mental health, on the mental health effects of COVID, which is often seen as like a middle class or upper class uh, set of issues, but pre making resources available to people across the economic uh, uh, spectrum, talking about the macroeconomic effects in a really honest and, ra you know, and radical way, in, in a way that's accessible to, to women entrepreneurs, not sugarcoating things, but rather talking about what the long-term horizons is, what the economic recovery perspectives are for the country, but in a way that radically democratizes information and, and creates the kind of response and the kind of place where people can see themselves, make their own informed choices, and, and drive uh, their own agency through the recovery process. And, and to your question about how we look back on this, I think that question of agency, uh, how the agency uh, of women in particular, how the agency of, of women and men in a household together uh, comes out, I think is one of the most interesting ones. Um, like Dr. Dot said at the top of the, the meeting, uh, this is a transformative moment. It's a moment to be radical. And it's a moment when, when the world is, is changing and, and the history of how we come out of this isn't, isn't yet written. And even as we lament the shocking and conscience shattering effects of gender-based violence, the long-term economic costs that will be borne by the poorest and, and particularly by women, there's an opportunity to really, really rethink how we as a world uh, support each other, how we manage crisis, and how is every household themselves envision their future, man, woman, child, uh, how they recover uh, together. I think there's an opportunity to really have some deep conversations about what it means to be a family, to be a society, to be a man, to be a woman, uh, uh, together. And so I think it's a transformative moment. And even if the costs have been really high, I hope it's one that we as a world don't lose uh, to drive a deeper conversation uh, towards the gender equity uh, that Jen and all of us, uh, Jen is leading uh, for the government side, but all of us deeply care about from the civil society side. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, 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 Kat, and really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Mike, and thanks for sharing all the great lessons learned that Search has um, garnered from all the work that you've done in conflict and facing epidemics all over the world. And thank you to all of our panelists for the work that you've done to meet this moment and to work towards a more equal and inclusive future. We will now switch to the question and answer portion of today's discussion using questions that were previously submitted as a part of everyone's registration. Um, I will start actually with a question for Rupa. From the point of view of healthcare workers, what can we do to build more resilient, inclusive healthcare systems to be better prepared for future health emergencies and pandemics? Thanks, thanks, Kat. There's so much I can, uh, you know, say on this particular point. So I'm going to really focus on five areas that are, are a must. First, we really need to uh, realize, and especially our political leaders, must accept that there will be other pandemics, and we need to be prepared. Denial is our worst enemy and the burden falls on health workers. Second, uh, we need to build health, social and economic systems that address health inequities between countries and within countries. Too often health workers are picking up the pieces of lives and bodies damaged by poverty, racial exclusion, overcrowded housing, as we've heard today, and that has been true in this pandemic. Solutions need to really make sure that we don't have inequality that lies outside the health system as well. 
Um, third, as I really mentioned earlier, is that we know that there is a global shortage of 14 million health and care workers, um, with 18 million of those being in low middle income countries. The estimates are that, that those numbers are going to be going up higher as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's time that we start looking at this health worker shortage as a serious issue and make a 50 year plan for human resources for health that invest in decent, equally paid and safe jobs for women, um, so that women really do have an equal say in, in leadership and they have the agency as uh, Mike was um, speaking about earlier. And particularly with women health workers as professionals, not as angels, we, we love to um, you know, applaud our health workers, which is, which is great, uh, but we really need to turn this applause into real investment and action. And they need to be valued for their contribution by having decent and safe jobs. And then fourth, really recognizing that this agenda of health security fits into the broader agenda of universal coverage, we need to invest in universal health coverage everywhere, including in the United States. I practice here um, in Washington, D.C., but I've also uh, practiced in other urban areas like Philadelphia and Cleveland. And, and no matter which part of the country I've um, trained or practiced in, I see the, the damage of not having universal health coverage. And so the U.S. itself um, uh, has recognized that health is a human right. And right now we know that globally we haven't achieved universal coverage and that is impacting women and girls. And we cannot realize um, universal coverage on, until we really have truly a gender equality approach, which includes having gender transformative policies for our health workers. And finally, we must act in solidarity. Um, we live in an interconnected world. Viruses don't respect national borders. And let's keep that in mind as we prioritize health workers and care workers around the world. Thanks so much, Rupa. And building on that same kind of theme question, um, what is, Gayatri, I'm gonna to move to you on this one. What is the best way to re-engage women in the workforce after they have had to step back and sacrifice their careers during this pandemic? Gayatri? Can you hear me? Okay, I was on mute. Um, I was gonna say that there, there are so many things that we need to think about, but I think first and foremost, we really need to invest in the care economy. We know that women are dropping out of the workforce. We know that they're not able to, to participate in economic activity because they are doing too much in other places and they are taking care of children and they, um, the, the child care industry itself is, is suffering. And so we really need to kind of echo the, the current administration's commitments on child care and building the care economy domestically in our global work. Um, secondly, I, we, we really need to target programs for women, um, women's uh, job placement, skills building, financial inclusion. These are all places where we need to catch up and where, where gender equality is incredibly important so that women can re-engage in, in the economy. Um, I, I, those are, I think, the top two things, but I, I think we also need to look at some, some of the longer term impacts. We know that women's income and women's job situation is, may not recover after the, the, the crisis, the way men's will. And so we, we really need to think about kind of, you know, how, what is our, our long game when it comes to bringing women back into the economy um, and, and getting ourselves back on track to achieve gender equality sometime in the next century, hopefully less. Um, we need to look at girls' education. I mean, there, there are so many girls, particularly uh, who were on the brink of maybe not getting past uh, primary education to begin with, who may not go back to school after this pandemic. I think Ambassador Thomas Greenfield mentioned the, the UNESCO study that said that 11 million girls uh, may not return to, to school. And that of course is gonna have longer term impacts on their uh, economic participation, their income, their economic security. So we need to look at that. Uh, and we need to look at the impact of economic insecurity now on the other aspects of women's lives. They you know, may, may lose status in their families and in their communities. They may be um, feeling uh, an inability to engage in decision-making or um, collaboration even within their families and homes. And so there, there are broader so social norm impacts of the economic insecurity that they're facing, facing right now that we need to think about as we craft policy solutions. 
Thanks so much, Gayatri. And Rupa, I think you wanted to add something to that? Just uh, really briefly agree with everything um, that Guy 3 has said, but we also really need to take a look at uh, the health sector itself it is one of the highest sectors with violence, bullying and harassment. A report released by the World Health Organization and Women in Global Health in 2019 called Delivered by Women Led by Men, a gender equity analysis of the health and social care workforce showed that at the upwards of even 50% of workplaces in the health sector show violence and harassment and bullying. We know these numbers have gone up in the COVID-19 um, time period, especially with the stigma associated with the virus and also all the other reasons that we've heard of uh, overall gender-based violence increasing in society and violence increasing. So there is an opportunity for us um, as, a, uh, as especially all the civil society advocates, but the, our government representatives and including the U.S. government to really consider ratifying the ILO uh, Convention 190, which is ensuring all workplaces, including um, informal workplaces, are free from all forms of violence and harassment, and that applies to all genders, this would have a huge impact and influence in keeping um, women in all genders really in the, in the workplace and in the health and care sector. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rupa. Um, Sava, this question is actually for you. Um, looking back and seeing some of the prominent trends and challenges from the field, especially your local partners, um, we've heard from some of our local partners that while services for GBV survivors have been delayed in general due to lack of funding and social distancing measures, in particular, that access to justice is especially difficult for survivors since most courts are still closed. How has the pandemic impacted access to justice for survivors? Yeah, we've actually heard mixed reports. Um, you know, in, so every country is, is, is different in how it's experiencing this. In some countries, courts are or are open and they're functioning, um, but they're not able to adapt to public health considerations, which is also posing a risk to people who are, you know, trying to seek access to justice. And then, of course, in other countries, the courts remain closed. But generally speaking, you know, legal assistance is overwhelmed, under-resourced. Um, police and courts are overwhelmed. Um, and sometimes we're also seeing from some of uh, some of our partners are telling us this that police you know, they don't want to get involved in domestic violence, as has traditionally been the case, um, and is slowly changing, hopefully, but um, where they see domestic violence as a family matter, now they really don't want to get involved because of the initial additional stigma of the virus. So, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, a range of challenges um, with, with regards to this. And, and also in some places, we've seen countries um, letting out or considering letting out perpetrators who are in jail already because of overcrowding in prisons and, and so taking in, into consideration social distancing measures there. Um, so the needs went up, but accessibility and resources are going down. But I think, you know, what this panel is at least showing us and with the new administration bring, bringing additional, you know, support and, and resources and focus, I think we can get back on track, hopefully. Thanks so much, Saba. And Gayatri, coming back to you. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected women and girls' participation in political and civic life? Uh, if you could kind of give some uh, overview of that as well. Yeah, um, well, CARE did a, a study on this as, as well, and, and really to look at how women and girls were being involved in leadership and decision-making at the national level on COVID responses. And the news was dim. We, we studied about 30 government responses and 74% of the governments that were surveyed, women were only a quarter of the, the government bodies who were part of decision-making and policy-making around the COVID response. And that's at the national level. We can imagine that at the, the local and community level, they're, even, they're being excluded even further. So in informal structures, they, we do need to pay more attention to how we're getting women and girls involved in decision making and leadership and participation in, in civic life. But I think one glimmer of hope, which um, you know, I was really pleased to see, is that some of the pre existing structures that development organizations have put into place, like village savings and loans associations, which are you know, small community level groups, really stepped up to the plate when it came to COVID response. Those are the ones who adapted their meetings. Um, to be able to meet socially distant or to meet via mobile devices so they could still gather, they could still uh, do their savings, do their lendings, provide crisis support to members in their community who are dealing with impacts of COVID, 
but they also leverage those groups to build awareness around how to prevent the, the spread of the disease. They use those, those uh, groups to buy supplies and sanitation um, uh, implements and, and things like that. And so, you know, we, we have an example of how when women and girls are involved and are, you know, bringing, being made part of the solution, they will come up with really good solutions and, and be active and, and helpful and meet the needs of the community. And so we, we need to think through areas like that. Thanks so much, Gayatri. Anna, this question is for you. Um, GBV needs support from everyone to put an end to it. What do you think is the role of the private sector and what opportunities exist, exist for the private sector to engage as we support efforts to build back an economy that works for all women and girls? Thank you. As I said before, uh, silence and not saying anything is what violence counts on to continue occurring. So I think the, the private sector has a a role to play, as I said, when I end to collaborate, first of all, and something that is not too complicated, into amplifying through our other channels information that is vital, as we do in our business model and try to amplify what we call the, the first approach, the bystanders network, by delivering not only information that is key for people experiencing it, but to the network surrounding in order to get involved, because the problem is that everyone is seeing what's going on and no one is taking part. So the private sector has to take part, as I said before. But I think they have to play a role during this context of COVID, not only with women accessing to work, but with women staying in work, staying, being able to stay because problems are not always, also, not all problems are from access, also to stay. And now we have the, I, 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 see, I saw someone mention the ELO convention, the 190 convention that encourages governments, but also the private sector to understand that no violence is accepted, but also that domestic violence and gender-based violence is an issue that they have to take into account. And nowadays, everyone here is working from home. Home is our workplace. So private sector has something to do with that because women have to stay in, but to stay in, we have to take into account what is going on at home and what tools are we going to deliver. In 2017, we developed the first protocol and leave for Avon employees, with female employees, in order for them to have the time to, to address their situation and the right way to, to assess them to take the best decisions, but the autonomy decisions they took. We were the first company in Argentina to do it. It was not, we didn't have to do it because Ilo said, we did it because it has to be done. In 2020, Avon launched the protocol and live worldwide. Every country within Avon East has a protocol to accompany their female employees because it's not only to say, oh, this is an important issue. It's also to play a role and to understand we have a role to play. And in this COVID content with everyone at home, there are no more excuses. They have to take into action. Thank you so much, Anna. And Mike, this last question is for you. Um, women and girls have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, but traditional means to provide safety and protection and our ways to monitor the effectiveness of those programs has been disrupted. In light of the constraints on in-person programs and monitoring for the near future, what are ways to identify and address gaps in protection, programming, and monitoring? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a, a great question, and it's one that all of that we think about sort of deeply every day. And I think some of them is are around establishing uh, new ways of of reaching out as everyone's life has come online. That's not only us sitting around Zoom, but it's you know people in from Afghanistan and Myanmar and everywhere. And one of the opportunities uh, that that creates is it's an oppor uh, to the extent that. Uh, we're able to use some of the, the techniques that uh, Anna and others have highlighted about safe communication, about sensitive issues, gender-based violence, domestic violence. To the extent that we're able to maintain that safety, there's an opportunity to bring people together across physical space to build online and virtual communities. Um, so for example, uh, the uh, remote volunteers in Syria 
um, uh, with uh, I am she are working with networks uh, of women across the country to talk with victims of domestic violence, but also to champion, for example, creative writing, expressive writing, advocacy, leveraging their own experiences um, to the extent that they feel safe, but some people who experience traumatic experiences feel comfortable uh, championing that to others. And you can create new champions in a way that was never possible uh, in, and in a way that can use advocacy to shift norms and shift protection uh, resources and responses. Um, so that's one measure. We've seen call lines and other kinds of things. Um, but that's one thing that gives me hope um, as we sort of adapt into this new uh, op into this new online world. It creates also opportunities for even um, some of the most most marginalized to the extent they feel, feel safe. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, and as we look to wrap up this discussion, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share one to two recommendations for policymakers to keep in mind as we work to address the impacts of COVID-19 on women and girls' rights, participation, and protection. Um, so I know I'm mindful that we are very short on time. And why don't we go ahead and start with Rupa? All right, thanks, Kat. Time, time just really flew here. So, you know, my message is really simple here. This pandemic has to break away from the past. This has to be the year we commit to a new social contract for women in the health and care sector. Women in the health and social sector want the means to have decent work, safety, dignity, fair pay, equal leadership, to do their jobs better and deliver stronger health outcomes for everyone. And equality of women um, in the health and care leadership strengthens health security for all systems. So particularly two final recommendations for policymakers. One, women are 70% of the health and care workers. They are the experts in the health systems they manage. We cannot fight global health challenges like a pandemic, drawing leadership from only half the talent pool. So make this a priority. There should be women included at all levels of decision making in the health and pandemic response. Second, invest in decent work for women in health and care. It's a foundation for stronger health systems and global health security. And let's really make sure that we end all forms of informal or underpaid work in the health and social sector. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rupa. Sapa? Yeah, so um, I would say I have a couple of recommendations, but I'm only going to limit it to to two or three. Um, domestic violence shelters should be considered essential service and there needs to be more awareness around domestic violence and its and, and gender-based violence and the effect of COVID um, on it. GB serv GBV services really do need to be prioritized. Funding needs to be open, uh, resourced and accessible. GBV services need to be accessible and they should be consistent and flexible and long-term. Um, and I think that partners really do need to be trusted as experts on the ground, you know, including their decision making capabilities and abilities and responding into times of crisis so funding should be a little should be more flexible in that way. And I would say also I mean we've heard so much from the uh, from President Biden and this administration, who's who has prioritized addressing violence against women throughout his career in public service so we really should mirror this commitment internationally to creating a foreign policy that empowers women and girls and removes barriers to, to, the, to their decision-making and leadership by funding organizations that can provide women and girls access to justice, justice and opportunities to flourish, consulting with them on every step of the way. Thanks so much, Saba. And now Gayatri? Sure, two things. Number one, all US government foreign assistance programs, initiative policies should be informed by a gender analysis. Um, it's incredibly important to make sure that we are accounting for the nuances and the power dynamics and the gender roles so that our work overseas does no harm and, and leaves no one behind. Um, USAID already has this requirement. We need to extend that to all of our programs. Secondly, we really need to invest in social safety nets. I, I talked earlier about investing in the care economy, but we need to go beyond that. We need to um, invest in approaches like cash transfers or food and nutrition subsidies, um, family planning, so that we're really kind of filling in the gaps that the COVID crisis has created and going beyond that so that we can recover equitably. Thanks so much, Gayatri. Anna? I think as, as my, uh, the people that spoke before said, gender perspective must, must be present in every area of the government. But I think, and, and I'm thinking about a law that is here in Argentina, that is the lay, the law Micaela. Micaela was a victim also of a femicide that obliged every member of the government to, come, to train and capacitate. So I think this is going on because it's not an issue for everyone. 
and to become and to become GBB an issue of everyone, we have to train and we have to deliver to all members of government this information to transversalize in their politics of daily politics. And the second thing I think it's important is to reinforce the idea of the coordinated community response. I talk about some femicides that those women had reported and the coordinated response was missing. And I remember the Vital Voices Justice Institute where we discussed with all actors and the effectivity they had because they improve the coordinated community response. If we don't uh, promote them, that in, in the territories, things will continue happening. If we continue working alone, we have to coordinate our efforts for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And Mike? Thanks. Um, two things. I think first, at a rhetorical level, but in a reality level, we can't treat uh, this is just a women's issue. This is a men's issue. This is a woman's issue. This is a family issue. This is a community issue. This is really about all of us. Um, and the deep sicknesses that lead to violence, inequality, uh, and that are caused by the, the shocks to the system affect each of us, and most deeply women, but it affects everyone, and all of us have a part to play. And I think that's something we need to keep first and, and foremost in, in our minds, in our messaging, and our engagement on this issue. And then the second is I would just really implore and encourage the policymakers here uh, to not only look at, at there's a, a lot of, of there's a litany of woes um, uh, to to uh, uh, to the present moment, but there's also some really positive things to invest in. Um, you know, for example, uh, the depth of the crisis: 90 female health, mostly female health workers in Yemen, sought training to become mediators to contribute not only to the health response, but to become an asset for the women, peace and security and the quest for peace in their, in their country. And so I ask that everyone here invest in not only fixing what's not working, but invest in the things that are and leverage the people who are emerging as the new sets of heroes coming out of this to drive change in their society and all of our world. Uh, and to do that past things like the gender community's request for the 2022 appropriations, for example, uh, but more deeply make sure all of us are looking at uh, at what's working uh, as well and seeing how we can line up behind uh, behind the real heroes uh, uh, of the present moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you again to all of our speakers for your rich and thoughtful insights and our audience members for their great questions. I am floored by just how great this panel was. Now it's I'm very pleased to introduce Ambassador Lisa Peterson, official for civilian security democracy, human rights, and acting assistant secretary for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor to provide closing remarks. Thank you all. Thank you, Kat, and hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you and to have the honor of closing out what has been an incredibly fruitful conversation. If we are to create a more just and equal world following this pandemic, we must take stock of the disproportionate effects it is having on women and girls around the world. That's exactly what today's conversation has allowed us to do. Thank you, Rupa, Saba, Gayatri, Anna, and Mike for sharing your expertise and recommendations with us today. We've heard how the lack of representation of women in decision-making processes is impacting our collective COVID-19 response. We've shed light on the shadow pandemic, the significant increases in gender-based violence that we've witnessed over the last year and the challenges that survivors continue to face in accessing health and support services, justice and protection. We've discussed lessons learned from past experiences with the Ebola crisis and how we can apply them to our COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. And through it all, we've been reminded of just how resilient women and girls are in the face of adversity and their ability to rise persist and move their communities forward. This conversation is just a start though. We in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor or DRL are committed to working with Ambassador Thomas Greenfield and the US Mission to the United Nations, the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues and the White House Gender Policy Council to turn these conversations into concrete actions to uplift the rights of women and girls in the United States and around the world, and to restore America as a champion for gender equality. Since 2014, DRL, in coordination with SGWE, has managed Voices Against Violence, the Gender-Based Violence Global Initiative. As you heard earlier, this unique public-private partnership between the Department of State and the Avon Foundation for Women 
is led by Vital Voices and its consortium of partners, including CARE, Global Fund for Women, and Promundo. It has provided emergency life-saving support to nearly 2,000 survivors of extreme forms of gender-based violence around the world, including more than 600 survivors since the start of the pandemic. I'm extremely proud today to announce that the United States has dedicated $2 million in COVID-specific funding for Voices Against Violence to continue responding to the increased rates of gender-based violence during the pandemic. In addition to urgent assistance, this funding is supporting small grants for local organizations to address the gendered secondary impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, including access to justice for GBV survivors and new training opportunities for the initiative's international network of GBV service providers, advocates, and survivors. This is just one way that the Department of State is working to support women and girls during and after the pandemic. We in DRL are also working with colleagues around the department to ensure that US strategies, policies, and programs are informed by an analysis of gender, power, and conflict dynamics consistent with our commitments under the US strategy for women, peace, and security. In multilateral fora, we raise the unique challenges faced by women and girls in both public and private life and advocate for equitable representation in decision-making roles in political, security, and justice institutions at all levels. We must also transform systemic and attitudinal barriers that prevent the full participation of women and girls with disabilities and cause higher rates of violence, poverty, and other harmful practices among such women, rates that have only worsened during COVID-19. Women and girls with disabilities and from other marginalized groups need to be at the table working side by side with governments, donors, businesses, and civil society to build inclusive and resilient social, political, and economic systems. We recognize that efforts to advance gender equality and prevent and respond to gender-based violence are a critical foundation for women's meaningful participation in decision-making processes and civic life. Throughout this pandemic, we've seen how women in positions of visible leadership, including as peace builders, human rights defenders, and civil society leaders, journalists, and public officials are increasingly subject to threats, harassment, intimidation, and other forms of gender-based violence by those who seek to silence their voices online and offline. The fundamental ability of women to participate fully and equally in democratic processes is tied to the international community's commitment to preventing and responding to all forms of gender-based violence, including that which is politically motivated. We firmly believe that all efforts to address gender-based violence must include individuals who are at heightened risk and may have a unique set of needs due to their membership in multiple intersecting identity groups. This may include marginalization due to their race, ethnicity, religion, age, socioeconomic position, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability status. These individuals are further marginalized in fragile and conflict affected states, and COVID-19 has only exacerbated these realities. We know there's much work to be done, but together we can make this world a safer place for everyone. Thank you again to our partners, speakers, and audience members for the great discussion, and special thanks to Vital Voices for hosting us on their Zoom platform. I'd also like to recognize and thank Lindsay Armstrong, Tambria Schroeder, Stephanie Ogrzalek, and Doreen Malady for their tireless efforts to make this event such a success. The Department of State looks forward to staying engaged with all of you on the important tasks ahead to support the full and equal participation and protection of women and girls around the world during and after this pandemic. We wish everyone good health and safety and hope you enjoy the rest of the 65th UN Commission on the Status of Women. Happy St. Patrick's Day to those who are celebrating in a COVID safe manner and have a good evening.